We are now recording. Um, this is the Sickle Cell GP study afternoon, um, and we're, I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Asad Lukmani, who's going to start the first presentation. Asad, over to you. OK, do you want me to start now, Jocelyn, or to wait um, until some uh, other people join? I would say start now because we're recording. OK. So um, just to let you know that, yeah, as Jocelyn mentioned, we are recording this session. And I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Not yet. Not as yet. Yeah, yeah, we can now. Yeah, okay. So th th thanks everyone for joining this session. Um, on, uh, I've modified the title of my talk slightly um, uh, so that we're going to be discussing the role of the primary care team in yeah. managing patients with sickle cell disease. Um, so I'm going to start with the first talk. And then my colleague, Dr. Okoli, is going to talk about some of the newer therapies which um, uh, are currently um, undergoing clinical trials and hopefully will be in uh, uh, accessible to patients with sickle cell disease in, in the near future. So before um, specifically talking about the role of primary care, I think it's nice just to give a little bit of background and put things into context. Um, in terms of how sickle cell disease um, affects um, uh, individuals and what the kind of global scale of sickle cell disease is. Um, so there are about 300, between three and 400,000 uh, individuals born every year with sickle cell disease. Um, and uh, it's, it's therefore one of the most common inherited disorders worldwide. And two thirds of affected individuals are in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in well-resourced countries, almost all newborns do quite well and survive into adulthood. But the picture in developing countries is very different, where there's a very high uh, early mortality uh, uh, in the first few years of life. The median survival for sickle cell disease has improved dramatically with better understanding of how to prevent infections and um, other, other treatments which have become available. And it's important to mention the effect of global migration on the epidemiology of sickle cell disease because we're now seeing far greater individuals with sickle cell disease in countries where previously uh, uh, there was not much um, experience in managing patients with, with the condition. And this is a really nice slide which I'd like to show. And um, this work has been done by Fred Peel at Imperial College. He's one of the uh, researchers in epidemiology and has a background in geography. And he's made this map of the world, but not as a map that we kind of generally generally see maps. This is based on uh, the size of the countries uh, proportionate to the number of sickle cell uh, individuals affected with sickle cell living in those countries. And you can see here that there are three real global hotspots. Um, with large numbers of patients with sickle cell disease in West Africa, predominantly Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, predominantly Congo, uh, Dep uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and the surrounding countries, and India. And it's these three areas of the world really which make up the large proportion of patients worldwide with sickle cell disease and really where public health measures need to be targeted if we're going to change the global uh, situation of sickle cell disease. So coming closer to home in the UK, there are approximately 15,000 patients living with sickling disorders, um, the majority of whom live in the southeast of the country. There is a uh, resource called the National Hemoglobinopathy Registry, which uh, has important demographic data about patients with sickle cell disease in the UK, which I'm going to be talking in a bit more detail about shortly. And at Imperial, uh, Hammersmith Hospital, where we manage the adult patients with sickle cell disease, we have approximately, approximately 400 patients with sickle cell disease under our care. And this is a slightly old slide. As I mentioned, there are now about 400 patients under our care. 
but this just shows um, the different genotypes of patients that we look after with sickling disorders, which again, which I'll come to in a bit more detail, and the age demographics, as expected in a chronic disease where the life expectancy generally is uh, between the uh, fifth and sixth decades. Um, majority of patients that we care for are in their 20s and 30s. And it's important to mention that there is a large number of paediatric patients under the care of the uh, paediatric centre in our trust, St Mary's Hospital. And every year, um, year on year, we have a number of patients um, transitioning across to the adult service. So we're, we're increasing in our, in our numbers every year. Again, here is another representation of the breakdown of patients by their genotypes. The majority of patients have the um, SS genotype, homozygosity for HBS, and these are the other genotypes which make up uh, common genotypes which make up sickling disorders. And uh, this just shows the uh, geographical areas where most of our patients are resident, which, which boroughs they live in. Hammersmith and Fulham, Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. And this is important because it determines uh, their kind of access to care in the community. So I mentioned the different genotypes that make up sickling disorders. Um, HBSS, um, which is uh, the most common genotype, is also referred to as sickle cell anemia. And then the other sickling genotypes or disorders include compound heterozygosity for S and C, compound heterozygosity for HBS and beta-0 thalassemia, and compound heterozygosity for sickles for HBS and some other variant hemoglobins like hemoglobin D or hemoglobin O. And some of these genotypes have a slightly milder phenotype than HBSS. Coming back to the National Hemoglobinopathy Registry, which I referred to earlier. So this was set up in 2010 and is really a, um, a a very important um, epidemiological resource that we now have at our disposal. And we're all encouraged as uh, centres that look after patients with hemoglobinopathies to um, register our patients on, on, this, uh, on this resource. And it's really become a means of monitoring the number of affected adults in uh, clinical centres and a means of reporting adverse events in these patients and demonstrating compliance with key standards of clinical care. And going forward, it's going to be a very important resource that we can draw on when we look at um, how we need to um, plan our future care and management of patients uh, nationally with sickle cell disorders and other, and other hemoglobinopathies. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the organisation of specialised services in hemoglobinopathy in the next uh, few slides. Um, so these can be divided into specialist hemoglobinopathy centres, and the local or linked uh, hospitals which look after patients with hemoglobinopathies and specialised services for patients with hemoglobinopathies are centrally commissioned by NHS England. And also just to mention that there has been a peer review programme since 2012 and 2013, um, which uh, consists of a uh, review against a agreed set of quality standards for each centre. Um, and this is not really meant as a punitive review. It's uh, very much uh, as an encouragement to review and improve our um, care for sickle cell patients. And there's no punitive action or measures to restrict services taken on the basis of this peer review programme. So recently there was a reorganisation of hemoglobinopathy services in the UK and the establishment of 10 regions um, or hemoglobinopathy coordinating centres. And these are overseen by a national hemoglobinopathy panel, which is represented from experts from the various um, hemoglobinopathy coordinating centres. And we still have the specialist hemoglobinopathy centres and the uh, local or linked uh, trusts or hospitals. And this is just showing the the uh, geographical distribution of the hemoglobinopathy coordinating centres. On the left here, you can see the uh, organisation for sickle cell services. Uh, there are 10 uh, geographical regions or coordinating centres, and we fall here into the West London hemoglobinopathy coordinating centre. 
And on the right here, you can see that there are four regions uh, for uh, thalassemia care. And we would fall into this one, as you can see, it's got very uh, large geographical area stretching right down to Cornwall and Devon. So the West London Hemoglobinopathy Centre is made up of three specialist trusts, um, hemoglobin uh, looking after patients with hemoglobinopathies, Imperial Healthcare Trust, London North West, which is uh, composed of Central Middlesex and Northwick Park, and St George's University Trust. And really this um, educational afternoon is uh, set up as part of the educational activities of the West London Hemoglobinopathy Coordinating Centre. And I'm not really going to uh, dwell on this, but this is just a slide to show the members of the hemoglobinopathy team at Imperial, looking after patients with sickle cell disease and other hemoglobinopathies. Uh, so there are four, four consultants, a clinical psychologist, a clinical nurse specialist, um, and Ra Ralph Brown, who's the coordinator of the hemoglobinopathy uh, centre. And um, as well as this core uh, group of healthcare professionals looking after hemoglobinopathy patients, there are other colleagues who are involved um, either by uh, looking after the inpatients when they're on the attending uh, on the attending rotor or on call um, involved in the uh, looking after these patients. So there's really quite a large team um, which, which is generally what we see at the specialist hemoglobinopathy centres um, looking after patients with hemoglobinopathies. Coming on now just to a little bit more about the chronic, acute and chronic complications of sickle cell disease before we come on to the main part of the talk, which is the involvement of primary care. So as I'm sure you know, sickle cell is a monogenic disorder caused by a single um, uh, point mutation in the beta globin gene resulting in a single amino acid substitution. And the main reason why sickle cell disease causes the clinical manifestations that we see is due to the fact that hemoglobin S polymerizes under deoxygenated conditions, which is not the case with normal hemoglobin A. And this results in two main manifestations. Um, one is the, the polymerization of hemoglobin S resulting in vaso occlusion, which leads to the crises that we, we see in patients, and also hemolysis, which is another important clinical manifestation of sickle cell disorders. So we generally divide the complications into acute and chronic complications of sickle cell disease, and the acute complications is what we generally tend to refer to as the crises. And by far the most common presentations that we see in patients are the acute painful crises. Um, and the second most important, and which is one of the leading causes of more potential causes of mortality in sickle cell patients, is um, the acute chest syndrome. So I'm going to talk a little bit later on about these two acute complications, but it's important to recognize also these acute complications that increase risk of infection, tripism, and uh, cerebrovascular complications of sickle cell disease. Chronic complications, the ones I'm going to just highlight are nephropathy, pulmonary hypertension, avascular necrosis, retinopathy, leg ulcers are ones that we commonly focus on um, and ones that we monitor for um, regularly. And here you can just see a pictorial representation again of these acute and chronic complications in sickle cell disease. The acute complications here are in the yellow colour and the chronic ones in the green, in the green colour. So in 2008, there was a, a confidential inquiry into the care of um, sickle cell disease in the UK, which was perceived as not, not, not being as, as, uh, as good or as adequate as, as it should be. And the, these next two, I just mentioned some of the key recommendations from the uh, NCPOD report, which they called a sickle cell crisis. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but I just want to highlight one or two of them. Um, so one of their recommendations was that in our multiracial society, it is essential that all doctors should have a basic understanding of the implication of thalassemia and sickle cell trait. And can I just ask um, if uh, people could mute their microphones? Thanks. 
Um, a multidisciplinary and multi-agency approach is needed in the ongoing pain management of patients with sickle cell disease. Essentially, this takes place outside the hospital for the majority of patients. And as I said, I'm not going to really read through all of these, but hopefully you should have access to these slides later to, to look at some of these quotes in more detail. A lot of these recommendations refer to the interaction and the integration of care between primary and secondary care. So, so a lot of the other um, of the, um, the forthcoming um, recommendations, which I'm going to be talking about, are based on the uh, latest edition of the UK standards of care for patients in the UK with sickle cell disease, which was uh, produced in co collaboration with the Sickle Cell Society. Okay. And one of the quotes um, in the section of this uh, um, kind of manual of care for clinical uh, for, for patients with sickle cell disease uh, uh, in the section uh, relating to the role of primary care, um, I've just included here, um, and it says taken from one of, one of the patients. The hospital consultants are knowledgeable and always on hand to help or advise. I have minimal contact with my GP in regards to my sickle cell. Now, you know, this is not meant to be taken in a, you know, a light where we, you know, we're highlighting kind of deficiencies in general practice. I mean, I'm sure that in many cases, um, uh, patients with sickle cell disease may, may actually have a really good relationship with their GP, and that's probably the majority of cases, but um, I think we also recognise that in a few cases, because sickle cell disease is perceived as a very uh, complicated condition and, and one that is managed by a very specialised team in hospital, that uh, it's felt that you know the um, the management should be primary in the hospital and not in primary care, and that's why some patients probably perceive that they they don't have a lot of interaction with their GP in regards to the sickle cell. And hopefully, what we're going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, we'll highlight that what, why there should be a lot more involvement and in interaction uh, from primary care with the, uh, in regards to the management of these patients. So these are some of the recommendations um, in the the, uh, the guide, the national guidelines. All adults with sickle cell disease should be registered with a GP. Primary care teams should maintain good communication with specialists and local hemoglobinopathy teams enabling a two-way exchange of expertise. And really this two-way uh, exchange is really crucial and very important. Um, and you know, things that we can do from our side is, that, for instance, when patients are discharged from hospital, ensure that adequate communication and discharge summaries are sent to the primary care team within a uh, acceptable time frame. Um, and this two-way communication is, is encouraged. Um, each sickle cell disease patient should be offered routine primary health care services at their GP surgery, and specialist hemoglobinopathy teams should develop locally agreed shared protocols, care, care protocols with GPs, defining the roles and responsibilities of each. Um, in terms of um, access to primary care, what access do patients have in the community um, or outside of the hospital? I mean, the first port of call for many of these patients would be friends and family, would be their kind of primary carers, and therefore a lot of education needs to be focused on uh, these individuals as well as, as the patient themselves. Uh, obviously, the GP practice and community services, including nursing, psychology, physiotherapy. Um, and these community services for patients with sickle cell disease are locally commissioned via the CCGs. The strength of primary care in managing patients with chronic diseases, including sickle cell disease, are that uh, in general, primary care, the primary care team has much more direct involvement with patients and their home support network and environment. There's a greater awareness of social, economic, family and psychological factors affecting the patient. And there tends to be a cradle to grave concept of care uh, when it comes to primary, uh, when it comes to the primary care team. Uh, patients generally are registered with the GP at the time of birth up until the time of their death. And these are other important aspects of uh, where the primary care team can be involved in, in uh, patients with sickle cell disorders, including reproductive health and advice, routine screening, um, both for complications of sickle cell disease, but also for other health, general, general health conditions. 
and management of other comorbidities. And particular areas of uh, focus should be given to the transition period, where we know that patients are much more vulnerable to um, not attending hospital or being lost to follow up when they're going from a team which they've uh, been looked after very closely um, to a new team which they, they may not know uh, very well at all. Hospital non-attenders, patients with complex psychosocial needs and uh, so these are again groups of patients that need a lot of focus, um, much of which can come from the primary care team um, and repeat, repeat prescriptions um, is also something which uh, the primary care team can really help with in patients with sickle cell disease, both uh, with respect to the kind of routine medications that we would advise all patients with sickle cell disease uh, should be taking, including the antibiotics, folic acid, um, and also their pain, uh, pain relieving medications. And this is all um, in collaboration with the, with the hospital team. Other specific recommendations include early treatment of infections to prevent sepsis, prescription of antibiotic prophylaxis, ensuring vaccines are up to date, early referral of pregnant women, we've already mentioned uh, reproductive advice, referral for psychological support and counselling, and um, encouraging treatment compliance, and self-management and education uh, regarding mild painful episodes which majority of patients tend to manage at home support during transition and moving to further education. Generally, when a child is diagnosed with sickle cell disease, um, having been born in hospital, the specialist nurse would inform the GP and the health visitor regarding uh, this diagnosis, and the child should then be referred to the local hospital hematologist and or paediatrician and the patient should receive appropriate, or the parents, sorry, should receive appropriate education um, regarding the, uh, the initial kind of management of patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, the GP can, can be involved in ensuring that prophylactic penicillin is prescribed by the age of three months and that folic acid is prescribed and that the child receives a full um, the, the child receives the full immunizations um, in recommendation of the national immunization guidelines um, as well as the particular vaccinations which are recommended in patients with sickle cell disease. So one of the important uh, um, advances that we've made in the care of patients with sickle cell disease is uh, better management of infections, both prophylaxis and treatment of infections. And the particular infections which patients with sickle cell disease are very, um, at risk of um, are uh, pneumococcal infections, and in particular invasive pneumococcal disease and other encapsulated organisms. And the reason uh, for this vulnerability is because of the loss of splenic function quite early on in childhood in patients with sickle cell disease. Um, salmonella infections, which tend to have a more severe manifestation in patients with sickle cell other gram-negative urine infections and complications following influenza. So we, the um, advice would be for um, children with sickle cell disease to receive the full uh, national uh, immunization uh, schedule and in addition to be immunized for uh, meningococcal ACWY and to receive the pneumococcal vaccine the um, polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine or pneumovax at the age of two years and then repeated every five years throughout adult life. And we also recommend that all patients with sickle cell disease should be up to date with hepatitis B vaccinations from the age of one year of age, particularly if they're receiving blood transfusions, but even otherwise because of the unpredictability um, of patients with sickle cell disease uh, requiring a blood transfusion at any point during their life. Um, and as well, as well having the annual seasonal flu vaccine. In adults, some of these vaccines, such as the um, conjugate uh, pneumococcal vaccine, which is now part of the routine childhood immunization schedule, were, were only introduced within the last few years. So adults may not have received these vaccines, and also they may not have received the meningococcal B vaccine 
or the ACWI or Hib Men's C vaccine. So if um, adult patients have not received these vaccines, then they should be offered all of these vaccines, um, as well as being given the pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide or pneumovax um, every five years throughout the adult, throughout the whole of their adult life. And um, as with children, they should be offered the annual flu vaccine and hepatitis B vaccines to maintain to maintain immunity, um, which we define as a, uh, a titer hepatitis B surface antibody titer of more than 100 uh, MIU per mil, which is considered to be protective. With regards to antibiotic prophylaxis, we recommend that patients take a lifelong prophylaxis um, with penicillin V or an alternative if they're penicillin allergic. The most high risk groups are children aged under five years and those aged 50 years. Current opinion is somewhat divided whether long term oral penicillin or other antibiotic prophylaxis lifelong is uh, really required or essential. And in patients who are not uh, on lifelong prophylaxis, either because of their own wishes um, or because of the, uh, the view of the, the healthcare team looking after that patient, then we recommend that they have a supply of antibiotics at home, which they can take in the event that they develop any signs of infection, either penicillin V, uh, 250 milligrams QDS, or amoxicillin or calmoxiclub. Um, when traveling, um, it's important that patients who are traveling to malaria endemic areas receive malaria chemoprophylaxis. There is a, a misconception sometimes that patients with sickle cell disease are protected from malaria, but this is absolutely not the case. And these patients can develop very severe malaria infection and they should be offered routine um, prophylaxis. Malaria prophylaxis of any type can be given to sickle cell disease patients. However, um, some of these patients may also have G6P D deficiency which may be an important bearing on which antibiotic, uh, sorry, anti-malarial choice um, is recommended for them. So their G6PD status should be checked and they should be offered appropriate travel vaccines. Other important things that can be monitored in primary care include blood pressure and the target that we recommend patients with sickle cell disease uh, should be maintained at are as shown here. The first line treatment for hypertension in patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, the recommendation is for a calcium channel blocker and diuretic should be avoided as per spine treatment. Um, the opinion on regular uh, folic acid, uh, there's not a great deal of evidence uh, supporting this, but generally we do recommend that patients uh, take lifelong folic acid replacement due to the higher turnover of red cells and um, uh, the uh, increased requirements of, of uh, red cell replacement. In patients who, uh, sickle cell patients who become pregnant, we recommend starting at a higher dose of five milligrams rather than the 400 micrograms recommended uh, generally. Vitamin D deficiency is quite an important topic and uh, it's well known that vitamin D deficiency is associated with a lot of signs uh, with a loss of complications and symptoms, including osteomalacia, increased factor risk, musculoskeletal pains, chronic fatigue, um, cardiovascular risk, asthma, nephropathy. And uh, as, as is well known, the rate of vitamin D deficiency is substantially higher in individuals from an African or Amer African American population than Caucasians. Um, and studies in sickle cell disease have shown an improvement in pain symptoms, bone density markers and quality of life with high dose vitamin D supplements. And I'm sure is, it is the case that, you know, in our letters to you, when we see patients in clinic, we, we constantly recommend vitamin D supplementation and it probably does get a bit tedious or sometimes when we keep recommending this, but uh, really there, there is quite good evidence that um, a lot of the symptoms which patients experience can be improved by, by vitamin D supplementation. Um, our, our recommendation in our trust, but this, this varies um, obviously for, according to local protocols, is 20,000 units of vitamin D weekly for three months um, and then a maintenance of 20,000 units over two weeks thereafter. 
other complications of sickle cell disease, which can be um, which can uh, kind of be monitored or in symptoms can be inquired about in general practice, including include sickle lung disease and pulmonary hypertension by inquiring about symptoms such as chest pain and shortness of breath on exertion, regular ch regularly checking oxygen saturations. Um, if, if there are any uh, concerns about any chronic lung complications, arranging for a ch chest X-ray um, and liaising with the hemoglobin team. Nephropathy is another important chronic complication of sickle cell disease. Um, and in general practice, um, this can be uh, managed by avoiding non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and other nephrotoxic drugs, maintaining the blood pressure according to the uh, targets that we mentioned earlier, treating urinary tract infections promptly, and checking blood test or if blood test to check for any other reason and there is any evidence of impaired renal function, then to liaise promptly with the hemoglobin of the team. Hydroxycarbamide is an important treatment that we use as a disease modifying treatment in many patients with sickle cell disease, and there's good evidence that it reduces the frequency of pain crises and other complications, acute complications of sickle cell disease, as well as some of the chronic complications of sickle cell disease. Um, it's important to be aware of situations where hydroxycarbamide should be urgently stopped, um, and these include if the neutrophil count is below 1.5 or platelets are less than 80, or if the hemoglobin is below 55. Um, and this is important also uh, for primary care, the primary care team to be aware of um, that hydroxycarbamide should be urgently stopped in these situations and to liaise with the hemoglobinopathy team. And if the patient has evidence of neutropenic sepsis, then obviously to uh, the patient to be admitted urgently to hospital. And um, just in the last uh, two or three minutes, I just want to mention some of the other important um, kind of screening for complications of sickle cell disease, which can be carried out in primary care. Um, so patients who present with severe bone pain requiring opioid analgesia causes can include a bony crisis, osteomyelitis or septic arthritis. Patients who present with pallor, shortness of breath or exhaust exhaustion, this could be due to anemia, other virus infection, sequestration, patients presenting with pyrexia or any of these other symptoms of sepsis. Um, this could be as due to acute chest syndrome as well as due to sepsis, most commonly, which is of a uh, respiratory source. Patients who are hypoxic, um, causes of hypoxia in sickle cell disease. Patients include um, respiratory infection, acute chest syndrome, or pulmonary embolus, and severe pain in the thoracic or back uh, regions include uh, pneumonia or acute chest syndrome. Diarrhea in a patient who's on iron chelation could be due to this in the air infection, and we'd recommend urgently stopping their um, iron chelation and referring to, referring to the hospital. Um, patients with sickle cell disease have a higher risk of CNS complications, so patients presenting with any neurological symptoms. Uh, again, this could be a, a, a manifestation of neurological complications of sickle cell disease. And priapism episodes lasting more than three to four hours, again, is a sickle cell emergency, and this can be managed initially by prompt analgesics, advising the patient to empty their bladder, um, and referring them immediately to a &E for any episode persisting more than two to three hours. And just to mention again that acute chest syndrome is a potentially life-threatening complication of sickle cell disease and its early recognition and treatment can be a very important factor in outcome in, in patients. So any of these symptoms in patients who might present to general practice um, so respiratory symptoms, cough, high fever above 38.5 on a single occasion or above 38 um, on two separate occasions, um, an hour apart, tachycardia, bronchial breathing, any uh, respiratory signs on examination or if a chest x-ray is done, 
um, any significant uh, chest x-ray changes, particularly bilateral changes, um, are all potentially uh, features suspicious of an acute chest syndrome and uh, prompt uh, action and referral of the patient to, to hospital is, is vital in these, in these cases. Okay, I'm just going to finish in the last couple of slides by just emphasizing the importance of a multidisciplinary team in managing patients with sickle cell disease. And this includes the hospital specialist and team, but also the GP and the primary care team. So I hope I've kind of um, shown examples of, of, of the involvement of the primary care team and, and their importance in managing these patients. Um, psychologist, social worker, dietitian, chronic pain services, and physiotherapists. And whilst we have access to a lot of these services in hospital, when the patients are discharged and when they're in the community, then we rely really on follow up in the community via many of these services uh, through primary through the primary care team. So in conclusion, sickle cell disease is a chronic multi-system disorder um, and often complicated by life threatening complications. And it's a condition which requires lifelong medical and psychosocial care. It is a very important public health issue for the NHS. Good care of patients improves their life expectancy and their quality of life and reduces disease complications, including neuro neurovascular complications and hospital admissions. And the importance of both the primary care and hospital based care and two way liaison between the teams is crucial in managing these patients. OK. So Excellent. Lot, Thank you. A lot of information in that talk. Um, and sorry, Justin, did you want to say something? No, I'm just going to say thank you, Assad. Excellent. Um, and there was something in the in the chat. Um, it said, hello, Dr. Lukmani. May, may I also add that each SD, uh, SCD patient is required to have a care plan set up by their GP, which is accessible not only by their GP, by, but by all primary health care team. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. Um, and I mean, at the moment, um, I think we're at a point where there's not uh, always sharing of information which is accessible between the uh, secondary care and primary care team. But I think as the NHS electronic documentation evolves, then I think I anticipate that there will be greater access for both teams to each other's kind of documentation. Excellent. Are there any other questions? If so, if not, I'll move on. Um, we're going to have a we're going to have a session. Oh, Stephen's just St Stephen's doing his session now on new yeah. therapies. Yeah, that's right. OK, I'll pass it on to Stephen to start. I think Stephen's he's left the chat. Bear with me, he should come back on. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's pressed of something by by mistake, and he's out of the meeting oh, now. Oh, the there you are, Stephen. I will pass it on to you. Stephen, you're, you're on, on mute. mute at the moment. Sorry again, everybody. My internet connection disappeared. So hopefully this will hold out for the length of the presentation. So I'll just get going. So my name is Stephen O'Coley. I'm a haematology consultant at the Hammersmith Hospital. And the main focus of my talk is to. Can you see my slides? Not no, yet. not yet. Hold on. Not yet. Let's see. Yep, is you can better? see them now. Yep. Excellent. OK, we'll start again. So, as I said, I'm Stephen O'Coley, haematologist at Hammersmith. And the main focus of my talk is going to be on novel treatments in hemoglobinopathies, particularly in relation to sickle cell disease. So the main learning point of the talk is, first of all, to touch. I know Assad has talked at length about the pathology of disease, but I'm just going to run through it in relation to these novel therapies describe and discuss a couple of those. Update you on the situation regarding stem cell transplant because this has been quite a long time coming. And then 
finally to touch on the current drug trials available with specific reference to gene therapy. So the pathology. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I know it's already been discussed at length. So uh, the adult hemoglobin consists of two alpha chains, two beta chains, and the single new type polymorphism gives rise to a conformational change in the uh, in the adult hemoglobin following a change in one of the amino acids. This results in a change to the uh, the structure of the protein when it's deoxygenated, and the consequence is that the cells become less mobile, less become more fragile, and as a result, can cause vasoclusion and ultimately hemolysis. So what we see, and I'm sure what you see with a lot of sickle cell patients is pain, but that's really only the tip of the iceberg. Sickle cell disease is a multi-system disorder, as that's what I've discussed. Oh, and I dropped off. Can you still see my presentation? Yep, we can. I can't. Okay. No, it's two. It's two windows. If you if you click on the um, Teams um, icon on the lower bar, you'll see two windows come up. The Teams icon on the lower bar. So the lower bar, right, right yep. across the bottom of the screen, where the um, team sign is. If you, if you just sort of like rest it over that, two screens should come up. One will be your presentation, and the other one will be um, the meeting. No. No. Do you want to? Do you want to? I'm going to disconnect and start again. Yeah, and start again. Yeah. Okay. Apologies, everyone. No problem. This. Virtual. This is the virtual of world we exist well, we're in, Stephen, in yeah. so that's fine. OK, better? Can yeah, much better. OK, yep. excellent. So as I said, multi-system disorder, uh, the pain is a slip of the iceberg, and but hopefully some of these newer treatments will enable us to manage a lot of these complications a lot better. This slide's very busy. The whole purpose of this slide is to show that there have been a whole raft of trials. The vast majority of the drugs used have been repurposed. So they've been drugs that were uh, initially designed for other disorders, which would have been uh, used in sickle cell disease. And unfortunately, the vast majority of them, effectively all but one, have been ineffective. The one that I'm talking about is hydroxycarbamide, which has been available to us for over 20 years now, reducing the frequency of painful crisis by at least a third and uh, chest, acute chest syndromes by at least 50%, and equally the need for blood transfusions. And I'm not going to focus too much on the vast majority of, uh, of these modes of action of hydroxycarbamide, just the two highlighted ones. The first of which is the increase in fetal hemoglobin, which I'll touch on a bit later, and also the modification of the vascular endothelial interactions, which is quite important for one of the drugs that we are hopefully going to start using fairly routinely. The other option available to us for the no, I wasn't The other options available for us yeah. with managing patients with severe sickle cell disease are transfusions. And oh, I think it's done it again. Have you lost it? I've lost it again. Because we can see it. OK, just, you know what, just do it again. bring it down and start again. Nightmare. No, that's fine. Bring it down and start. Just continue. Oh. OK. Let's hope it holds up the rest of the presentation. Uh, maybe I should speak a bit faster. Uh, so top-up transfusion, exchange blood transfusions, but these don't come without problems. Uh, the first is the development of red cell alloantibodies, and this can increase the risk of acute of transfusion reactions and can sometimes make patients more difficult to transfuse. And in some 
small number of patients impossible to transfuse. Iron overload is a second problem. This is less common with the patients to the exchanges and transfusion associated infections, but hopefully uh, this is becoming a less of an issue. So as Asad alluded to, the, uh, the uh, life expectancy has improved dramatically over the last few years from a quite shocking uh, 45 years uh, in the mid 90s to about 67 years when last assessed in 2016. However, this is far from ideal. Uh, that 67 years is just under 15 years, the life expectancy of a non-sickle peer. So we still have quite a lot of work to do. And I'm hopeful that some of these novel agents will make a difference to try and improve the life expectancy for a lot of our patients. Crezanluzumab, now this is a monoclonal antibody which targets a, an adhesion protein called P-selectin. So this slide tries to illustrate the way in which this protein works. So the P-selectin in an inflamed situation binds the, uh, the, the, the white cell and aids in its rolling and tethering and ultimately leads to the excitosis and the pro-inflammatory, aids the pro-inflammatory process. As you know, six disease is a very inflammatory uh, disorder, but there, there's more to it. The P-selectin is also responsible for not only adhering white cells, but also sickle cells and also interactions with platelets. And this is important for the vasoclusive process that characterizes sickle cell disease. So if you can block that process by a drug such as crezaluzumab, then you can somehow, you can sometimes, well, you can overcome some of the, the downstream effects of both the vasoclusion and the hemolysis. So the sustained trial looked into this. It's a, sec, it's a, it's a phase two multi-center placebo-controlled trial of almost 200 patients. They were randomized into a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio between low dose, high dose, Crezanluzumab and placebo, a whole range of ages and genotypes, but the, the more severe ones, more severe sickle genotypes. And these were patients who had multiple uh, vasoclusive crises, painful crises. Interestingly, the trial included a, so, uh, a cohort of patients who were already on disease modifying treatment in the form of hydroxycarbamide. The patients received monthly infusions of the drug for a total of a year. And the main, well, the primary endpoint was to see if this impacted on the frequency of acute painful crises. They also, secondary uh, endpoints, looked at the uh, annual hospitalization of patients and the time to first painful crisis on, after starting the treatment. So this slide in gold shows the crezaluzumab arm in both the hydroxycarbamide and the non-hydroxycarbamide cohorts. You can see an almost reduction in third, reduction of almost a third in patients who on crezaluzumab compared to placebo in relation to painful crises. And that, as you would expect, is even more dramatic on those patients who are not on any therapy at all, of 50%. So really quite efficacious. As for the secondary endpoints, one of which was the annual rate of hospitalization, and that was reduced by 42%, while the time to first attendance with a, a painful crisis was greater than th threefold. So it took three times as long for these patients to turn up in A&E in a painful crisis compared to those not on quesanlusumab. So in conclusion, a really effective drug are reducing the frequency of painful crises, relatively minor side effects, most of which related to the actual infusion itself, because with a lot of these monoclonal antibodies can give rise to flu-like symptoms and uh, crezaluzumab is not different in that way. But uh, these tended to get better with subsequent infusions. 
relatively easily administered with a monthly infusion. This, is, this drug is actually now FDA approved and hopefully by the end of September we'll have a decision on from NICE as to whether it will be, we can use it in the UK. And there's ongoing trials because at the moment all we know, all that we have from the trial data that it, it reduces the incidence of painful crisis, but we don't really know much about the other sequelae of disease, how it affects the other, well, how it will reduce the impact on other organs. So that work is ongoing. The second drug I wanted to talk about was uh, is uh, Voxelator or GBT440. Now this work, drug works in a very different way. So what it does is it binds to the alpha globin chains of the sickle hemoglobin, stabilizing it. And by stabilizing it, it increases the oxygen affinity. So the, the sickle red cell, which is a low affinity hemoglobin, is less likely to give away its hemoglobin. And as you recall from the early slides, this then means that you don't have the cascade events that occur when the, the, the sickle hemoglobin becomes deoxygenated. So really quite a neat way of trying to overcome the problem. This was assessed in uh, the HOPE study, which is a phase three multi-center, I think about 60 centers worldwide, a placebo controlled trial of 274 patients. Very similar to the Crezaluzumab, there were there's a three-way split in the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio between low dose, high dose, and placebo. And they selected patients based on the incidence of painful crisis. And again, it was the more severe phenotypes that were chosen. The primary endpoint was to identify those patients. The primary target was for all patients to have a hemoglobin rise of at least 10 grams in the first 24 weeks. The secondary endpoints were a reduction in hemolytic markers. And again, again, as per the Kresluzma trial, the annual incidence of presentation with vaso occlusion. So quite impressive results. So by 90 days, so very much short of that 24 week target, 80 out of the 90 patients that were subsequent that had got to that stage had on the, in the crezoluzumab arm, the high dose crezoluzumab arm, had, had achieved the, 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 the primary endpoint of reduction of hemoglobin by, by oh, sorry, increase of hemoglobin uh, by 10 grams. The instant of base occlusion, occlusion was reduced and quite rapidly, the uh, incidence of hemolysis was significantly reduced. And I'll illustrate that in the next two slides. So this, slide tries to illustrate the hemoglobin rise at 24 weeks as per the, the first, the primary endpoint. Uh, so with the high dose crezaluzumab arm, the dark blue, you can see in almost 80% of those patients, the patients had achieved that target. I apologize, it's in, it's in American, this is American trial, so it's, it's one gram per deciliter as opposed to 10 grams per liter. I'm sure we'll be able to work through that. And then Patients, about 60% of those achieved a 20 gram increase and a small but not insignificant patient, a uh, group of patients achieved, 20% a 20, a 20 of those achieved a 30 gram increase, which is really impressive. So one of the markers of, of uh, hemolysis, uh, the accumulation of uh, unconjugated bilirubin. So this slide shows uh, in the placebo arm in red and the GBT440 or uh, voxelator arm in purple. And as you can see that there's a quite significant drop off in the, uh, the active arm, which is sustained for the whole 90, 90, the first 90 days. So in summary, this, well, actually not in summary, summary is the next slide, but this is a well-tolerated drug with few side effects. The main side effects, main, more severe side effects, which were mild to moderate, they were the, the onset of a rash. And I think of the four patients that had a more severe rash, one of which uh, continued with treatment within a few days that resolved. A second patient, had a short interruption, I think of about four or five days, 
and then resumed on treatment and again the rash resolved while the third patient or the third and the fourth patient unfortunately had to drop out of the trial so and regarding other side effects the vast majority of them were no different from the placebo or the low dose crizalizumab so one of the questions was Is Stephen frozen? Oh. Yep. I, I, it, you were frozen there for a minute, Stephen. Whenever, whenever... Sorry? Yeah, no, I said you were frozen there for a minute. Just carry on. Okay. That's fine. Your slides have disappeared, though. They are coming back now? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the last thing I was going to talk about was related to safety was there was a concern that these patients because we are now shifting the oxygen association, increasing oxygen association, that tissue oxygenation would be compromised. Now, there's a couple of things to mention here. First of all, that sickle hemoglobin is a low affinity hemoglobin. So actually, sickle hemoglobin gives away oxygen a lot more readily than you would expect with normal adult hemoglobin. And in fact, the trial data looked at this and it identified that the shift to increase affinity was actually moved it closer to normal adult hemoglobin. So the work they did actually showed that there was no increase in, in tissue hypoxia as a consequence of this new drug. So very reassuring. So yes, as I promised the, the conclusion, so most patients showed a significant increase in hemoglobin. So a rapid and durable response in respect to hemolysis it was very well tolerated and administered as a once a day uh, capsule. So very easy to administer. Again, this is now FDA approved and we should get a, a decision from NICE by the end of August. And as per the, the Crezaluzumab trial, there were ongoing studies to identify its impact on end organs. So I'm just going to touch on stem cell transplantation because this is, at the moment is the only therapy that we have available that actually cures sickle cell disease. So, transplantation for pediatrics has been available for some time and the results have all been quite impressive, but there has been a degree of reluctancy by NHS England, and I'll go into the reasons why in the next slide uh, for uh, the commissioners authorizing funding for adults. One of the other problems is that we note from the, the, the trials in pediatrics that only about between 16 and 18 percent of children have a matched sibling donor that would be able to donate stem cells for their transplant. So unfortunately, though this is a very exciting time, it's by no means a panacea, there'll be a significant proportion of our patients who will not be eligible purely because they don't have a matched sibling donor to donate stem cells for the transplant. There are quite specific criteria for uh, patients that we put forward for transplantation, but in general, it is those patients who have high risk of complications, those that have, a, have significant comorbidities that would reduce their mortality, their 10 year mortality uh, by 25%. And these include things like pulmonary hypertension, stroke, and also those patients, there's good evidence that those patients had, had at least four severe crises in, in one calendar year, are, have, a, have a 10 year reduced mortality uh, by 25 percent. And also, obviously, those patients who have tried, tried treatment is either infective or in their intolerant. So the reason there's, there's been a degree of hesitancy is because, unfortunately, unlike the pediatric setting, we've got very little data to, to definitively, clearly uh, show the benefit of allergenic stem cell transplantation. Okay. 
This is because some of the trials, the very few trials, and they only used about five trials in the, 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 the commission used about five trials in the assessment of sickle cell patients, adult sickle cell transplants. But there are very few trials, as I said, the, the, the design of these trials is often quite limited and follow up, unfortunately, is not optimal. There's also been also, also been a, a, a concern of the suitability of adults with sickle cell disease for stem cell transplants because there was a concern that with increasing comorbidities, as you grow and get older and get exposed to the chronic hemolysis and chronic phase occlusion, that you, you build up a, a series of organ damage, which puts you at higher risk of mortality related to transplantation. And then the final thing is tolerability. So the, as I mentioned earlier, sickle cell disease is a, an inflammatory disorder and the bone marrow is quite aggressive. And the concern was that the transplanted cells may find that a very difficult environment to, to engraft for the stem cells to move into the bone marrow and start to function. And we may lose the, the transplanted cells relatively early before that reason. So the outcomes from the various trials suggested actually a lot of those things weren't, weren't valid. It suggested that the overall more, uh, survival for these patients was between 80 and 100 percent at, at four years. It was quite, and, and I guess to a certain sense, it, it's not to be not not surprising, but there was a significant improvement in quality of life assessments for all these patients. Hospitalization and opioid use dropped off quite dramatically, and it was very well tolerated. Though very limited data, at just over three years, we had when there were no deaths recorded. So, as I said, unfortunately, not all patients will have a matched sibling donor. So there will be a, a significant cohort of our patients who, though fulfill criteria for transplantation, will be a, a, unable to have one. So there are some additional clinical trials that may be beneficial to these patients. So gene therapy. So gene therapy, there are several ways in relation to hemoglobinopathies in which we can utilize gene therapy. Either we can, you effectively ignore the sickle cell uh, gene and insert a new gene, which ameliorates disease. And effectively that's what happens with exchange blood transfusion. You try and remove as many of the sickle cells as you can and add new blood in the hope that that will try and modify disease and prevent the se severe complications that we've previously described. The second option is to turn off the defective gene by reactivating another dream, gene. And in this case, that's fetal hemo uh, the gene for fetal hemoglobin or gamma hemoglobin the gamma change, I should say. And then the final thing is to correct the defect. And uh, we're not at that stage yet, but that is ultimately the hope. So this, so in, re in relation to gene therapy and insertion of the new gene, just run through this very quickly. So you have your patient, you collect those stem cells, and those stem cells are ex vivo, they're, they're manipulated. In this case, we insert a virus, or we, we treat the cells with a virus which inserts the gene for non-sickling hemoglobin. In the meantime, the patient is prepared, their bone marrow is prepared with chemotherapy, and this chemotherapy ablates the residual bone marrow so that these new stem cells that are infused can engraft into the, uh, the, the patient and uh, start to produce uh, the cells that we wanted to and the hemoglobin we want to. So one of the trials is the lentiglobin trial that uh, that is a multi-centered open label state, uh, phase one, two trial in patients with transfusion dependent uh, thalassemia. So thalassemia is a, 
uh, is a disorder that affects the same uh, the same the same uh, this affects beta globin it's similar to, to sickle but instead of causing a point mutation either that they're, they're often there are deletions that cause either reduction of production a reduction in the production of the beta globin chains or a complete absence of beta globin chain so these patients are transfusion dependent a lot of these patients are transfusion dependent i should say so the uh, the phase one study looked at very small numbers 13 patients uh, of those age who are transfusion dependent heavily transfusion dependent and they underwent the process that i described in the previous slide and this is the data from 26 months but this is an ongoing trial i think they've been offered up to i think beyond five years follow-up so of the of the 13 patients 12 were transfusion independent within six months which is quite impressive and then and was very toler well tolerated there were very little in the way of of, of side effects and complications that can due to the transplant the second group is the lentoglobin gene the same gene therapy which is exactly the same uh, preparation but in this case using sickle cell patients patients who have uh, have repeated painful crises and several multiple complications but either failed or intolerant to current treatments and in this case it was 17 patients all of which within three months three to six months of treatment was uh, were pain-free developed no other complications including the more worrying ones like an acute chest syndrome and this Hemoglobin, which is the non-sickling hemoglobin that I was, I was I was talking about, this gene insertion increases causes the production of. We saw an, a significant increase in hemoglobin of, of the proportion of that hemoglobin, and not only that, a significant increase of the general hemoglobin as a result. Side effects were relatively mild. Uh, usual transplant-related side effects. However, the trial unfortunately has had to be suspended because two patients one patient who was part of the first of the phase one trial who received treatment about five and a half years ago has unfortunately developed aml and that was quite quickly followed by another patient who uh, received treatment a few months a few months later but now we're th three and a half years down the road and that patient developed myelodysplastic syndrome. On looking back, the, the study coordinators reviewed the initial stem cells of the first patient who developed AML and they had high risk genetic abnormalities from the initial stem cells before transplantation that would put them at high risk of developing AML. So the, the general consensus is that, that, that the treatment was unlikely to have caused this problem. However, the second patient, which the investigation is ongoing, that patient has, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a suspicion that the conditioning, the, the, the treatment that we use to prepare the bone marrow may have contributed to the onset of myelodysplastic syndrome. So the hope is at some stage that with it, this trial will be be restarted but for the time being that's been put on hold. So gene editing is the second uh, modality that I talked about regarding gene therapy and basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to switch back on the gene that's responsible for producing fetal hemoglobin. So at about two, two months most patients or most people undergo uh, hemoglobin switching and the gene for the production of beta hemoglobin is switched off and in most patients they start to produce adult hemoglobin but obviously in sickle cell patients adult hemoglobin is not produced but unfortunately what they end ultimately produce is sickle hemoglobin so if we can switch that if we can somehow switch that we can turn that switch so we are now producing fetal hemoglobin then we we bypass the main problem just to, again, to try as part as per orientation, 
alpha beta hemoglobin composes of alpha hemoglobin chains and gamma hemoglobin. So there's no beta hemoglobin. So there's no risk of polymerization and all those downstream problems you see in sickle cell patients. So this slide's quite complicated and I've tried my best to try and simplify it a bit. Uh, but the genetic switch is this protein, this transcription factor called BCL11A. And what happens at this at hemoglobin switching is that this protein is produced and it binds to a region upstream of these of the, the gene, the gene for both gamma and beta beta globins, and effectively ensures the production of beta hemoglobin. So beta globins. And Unfortunately, that will result in the production of, fetal hemo of uh, sickle hemoglobin because of the problems associated with the mutation. Now, if we can manipulate that region, so this BCL11A, this genetic switch, cannot no longer bind to uh, the promoter region, then the, we will revert back to the, 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 the to type and you'll produce more gamma globin chains. And the predominant hemoglobin, instead of being sickle hemoglobin, would then be fetal hemoglobin. So just to run through this bit quickly, because we've gone through this already, but it's the, the only difference between this and the last example is the uh, manipulation stage. In this situation, we are adding the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing package that edits that promoter region that I talked about and allows for production of these stem cells to produce gamma globin chains instead of defective beta globin chains. This slide is really just to emphasize the, uh, the value of uh, these two researchers who received the Nobel Prize last year for chemistry for the identification of the CRISPR-Cas9 system which is effectively, in, in our context, is effectively genetic scissors. So the CRISPR element, with, which is the genetic element, that directs the protein, which is the Cas9. And this Cas9 protein is a, uh, an enzyme which cuts at a region that the CRISPR guides it to. And so, there have been trials in both sickle cell disease and transfusion dependent thalassemia, both of which uh, disrupt the BCL11A binding site and hopefully increase the production of fetal hemoglobin. There have been two trials, both early phase trials, uh, both called CLIMB, and the first one, CLIMB 111, is in transfusion dependent thalassemics, whereby the primary endpoint, one of the primary endpoints is to uh, hopefully achieve transfusion independence by six months after infusion. We've seen outcomes for seven of the 45 patients. It's all very early stage. They, they, they reported a couple of months ago. And all of those patients after three months were transfusion independent. I just want to illustrate that by one of the cases that they described. So this is a thalassemic patient who produces a small amount of fetal hemoglobin and has a total hemoglobin of nine or 90. Months after treatment, they have a, a baseline hemoglobin of 141 with a contribution of fetal hemoglobin of 93%. The second study is effectively the same treatment, but this is this time in sickle cell patients. Ex identical design, but patients who have had repeated severe vasoclusive crises in the last two years. The one of the primary endpoints was to identify a rise in fetal hemoglobin of more than 20% six months after treatment, and this to be sustained for at least three months. They reported on only three of their cases. And 
in all cases, they have had no further sickling crisis and have achieved that target of 20%. So again, this is, an, well, another, this, this, this is one of those patients, one of those three patients. They had a starting hemoglobin of 72 with hemoglobin F contributing 9%. And 15 months after infusion, their hemoglobin had gone up to 120 with a quite impressive 93% fetal hemoglobin. Now with that case, there were some relatively minor complications. She did require a transfusion, nine, repeated transfusion up to 19 days post-transplant, but didn't have any vasoclusive crisis following uh, the, the, the treatment, the infusion of the, 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 the treatment. And adverse effects were relatively limited. These were all transplant related. So the, the, the sepsis was non neutropenic sepsis, and the abdominal pain we think related to the conditioning treatment they, they, the, the patient had, which is uh, a known complication. So both CLIMB studies quite clearly illustrate that the gene editing process was highly efficacious, showed a quite significant increase in fetal hemoglobin in. in all reported cases with a durable response. So in a thalassemic uh, trial, 18 months, and the uh, sickle trial, 15 months. But obviously further work and further trial data is required. So I just want to finish off with by talking about a few of the active trials we have here at, uh, at Imperial. The first is the Quezaluzumab trial which is a phase two uh, trial, which is currently recruiting, which uh, is recruiting to try and identify whether, as I described, we can limit some of the end organ damage associated with sickle cell disease with these treatments. The second trial is using exchange transfusions in pregnancy to try and see if regular routine exchanges can improve fetal and maternal outcomes. Third trial is hemopexin. Hemopexin is a, uh, a uh, free hemoglobin scavenger. And the hope is that this will mop up free hemoglobin, which has significant impact on both kidneys and nitric oxide production. AG348, which is actually is getting close to slight license for pyruvate kinase, they identified that this may be beneficial to sickle cell patients. And the, the idea is that this drug does a similar thing to voxelator, GBT440, by, by increasing oxygen affinity and thereby preventing all of the polymerization and the cascade events that subsequently occur. And then there is a haploidentical trial, which is hopefully going to be available fairly soon in sickle cell disease. And this looks to uh, transplant patients with half matches. So siblings who don't, aren't a full match, but a half match or parents even that are half matches. So that should hopefully expand the number of patients that we can offer transplantation to. But this is at all relatively early days. So in conclusion, life expectancy has improved significantly over the last few years, but we have a lot of work to do. Current disease modifying therapies do have some efficacy, but are extremely limited. We have quite a few exciting new drug therapies coming online. But there is a lot of work, again, not a lot of work to do to try and validate them to prove that they are effective at preventing some of the very severe complications of sickle cell disease. Allogenic stem cell transplant, unfortunately, is not going to be the panacea, but we hopefully we will be able to offer this to a, a cohort of our patients with severe disease. And new targeted treatments, those need to be validated, and I'm hopeful that. Trials like the Steadfast trial will help do that. And finally, 
I'm very optimistic that gene therapy will revolutionize the way in which you treat our patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, we're I'm going about to unshare ten... now. Yeah. Hopefully. We're about 10 minutes behind. So what I'll do, oops, there's some feedback there. Um, so what I'll do, we'll have a five minute um, break, just if you guys want to um, get a coffee or what have you, and then we'll come back at 25 past and continue with Dr. Jeremy Anderson, and he's going to be talking about pain um, and pain management. So um, let's basically not leave the room, but just you can turn your cameras off, go and make a coffee, go to the loo, do whatever you've got to do, and we'll be back here again in five minutes. And also to remind um, our attendees, I have put the programme for the event today at the top of the chat facility along with the evaluation form but I'll have a word about that later so five minutes we'll be back at 25 with Dr Jeremy Anderson. Joy can I just suggest that after the break um, if anyone wants to ask questions about the first two talks they they can. No that's just absolutely a, fine. Two, two or three We're minutes do for some questions. Yeah okay fine. Yeah, no that's yeah. fine when we come back so 25 past. Everybody, is my presentation coming through? For anyone who is still on the call, can you see my presentation? Hi, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, I can see no, it. You can't hear me. Yes, 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 oh. we can see it. Sorry. OK, it's working. That's great. OK, I was having problems with my Teams app, and so I'm using the browser, but I'm just glad it's working. OK. OK, do you want to put it in slide view and see how it goes moving it? OK, how about that? Nothing yet. It's not changing. It's not changing. OK. Um, Are you putting it in slide? Maybe that's. Yeah, it looks that's, like I can see from your screen that side um, slide view is. Yeah, it has been opted for. I don't okay. know. But you're seeing the whole window. OK, I, I can see it. If you're happy to just scroll down, then okay. that that's. Oh, hold on. Let me try something here. So. Um, So I'm saying open. Screen share. Let's just go the, let's just select the entire screen. Mm -hmm. And then, so this is me trying to share the entire screen. Yep. Is that, is that yep. coming through properly? It's coming through and in slide view. Okay. Try to try to go to the next slide. Let's see if that's yep, brilliant. Okay, back to okay. the first one, and we're ready in about a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, brilliant.
Right, Jeremy, are you there? I hope he's just gone to get some water. OK, but that's fine. We're going to, as as Asad said before, we had the five minute break. Um, if there are any questions, I don't know if everybody's come back in as yet, but um, are there any questions at all for the first two presentations? I can't see. Oh, some people are just coming back. Are there any questions for the first two presentations? No, no, I don't think so. All right, we'll 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 continue with um Jeremy when he comes when he comes back. Jeremy, are you back? I'll send him, I'll send him a message. If you bear with us a moment. Are you back, Jeremy? Oh, brilliant. You're sharing the screen at the moment. Yep, that's it. I don't know if you're on mute, but I can't hear you. Oh, you are on mute. Jeremy, can you unmute yourself? There we go. OK, can everyone hear me now? Yep, we can hear okay. you. Great, so we're, we're ready to go then. When you're ready to start. OK, excellent. So um, so my name is Jeremy. I'm the sickle cell psychologist at Hammersmith Hospital. And what I'm going to be talking with you about today is uh, dealing with persistent pain in sickle cell disease. But before I do that, I want to ask you just to contemplate a question. Um, and it's something I ask patients all the time, which is, what is pain? We've all, almost all of us, uh, have experienced pain. Obviously, our patients experience pain quite a bit. Many of us treat pain. But, you know, if you think about what is it as a, as a quality, what is pain? And when you think about it, sometimes it's kind of hard to define it. And luckily, we have the International Association for the Study of Pain, and they've given us a, a definition, and that is that pain is considered an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, which doesn't sound very clear at all. So I think the key point of the, of the definition is that pain is, is a sensation, but it's not a sensation like any other sensation. If I look at a rose and I can see that the rose is red, the redness is just light hitting my eyeballs and being interpreted by, by my brain. But it doesn't have any particular emotional, the redness doesn't have any emotional valence to it. Pain is different. Pain has an emotional valence to it. It is actually unpleasant to be in pain and it comes with distress. The other thing about the definition is that nowhere in the definition did it require that there be physical injury or damage to the body in order to have pain. You can have pain with no damage. And what we'll see later is that our understanding of how the brain makes pain is, is that pain is more about a perceived threat or danger rather than actual damage. I know obviously pain and damage are often paired together and we kind of assume those two things go together, but they really don't. And also the thing is that 
pain is inherently a matter of subjective experience. You have to be a person who can have an experience in order to have pain. And, and that's because pain is something that your brain does. So uh, what I've got here is, is Melzack's uh, gate control theory of pain. So people may have seen this before, but the idea is that um, extending down from the brain, you have various signal pathways. And this circle in the middle here is really the spinal cord or the dorsal horn, um, where I've got it saying injury stimulates these nerve fibers. It, not necessarily an injury. It could be really anything that stimulates those nerve fibers. There's different kinds of fibers and they come into the, to the spinal cord. And if this gate is open um, and signals can pass through, they get passed up to the brain where they get interpreted as pain. Um, but there are other things that kind of close this gate. And another, and one of those is our, our touch nerve fibers. So this is like when you're walking along and you sm smash your shin against a coffee table, what do you do? Well, after uttering a swear word, you might rub your shin, right? And if you rub your shin, it will actually make it feel better. You won't feel as much pain. Why is that? Because you're stimulating the touch nerves. They're beating the pain signals to the, to the gate and they're, they're blocking the signals and preventing um, you from experiencing pain. You haven't sort of uninjured your shin. The other thing uh, to note about the model is this inhibitory descending pathway. That is, there are signals from the brain that can close the gate. Um, and that has to do with the way your brain uh, perceives the signal and the level of threat. Okay. And the reason we know this is true is obviously if, if people uh, suffer a spinal cord injury and you know those signals can't get to the brain, well, they don't feel pain from injuries to that part of the body. Um, and so, and, and also, um, we know that pain is happening in the brain because um, people can have experiences where they're injured, but they don't feel pain. So I wouldn't be a good Canadian if I didn't have an ice hockey reference, but um, there's plenty of examples in athletics where people are focused on what they need to do, even though they get severely injured sometimes intentionally by other players. This might be an example closer to home for people um, where people are just busy, focused on something. They don't notice the pain until later. Um, and also you can see this is a, an amputee playing with a virtual reality headset. Um, when people lose a limb, they have something called phantom limb pain. And this is an example where people are actually feeling pain generated in the brain. And it feels like it's pain in a part of the body that doesn't exist anymore. So it, it can't actually be damaged in that part of the body because they don't have that part of their body. The pain is happening in their brain. And so the whole point of this is to tell you that all pain is psychological, right? Oftentimes our, our patients have the idea that there is sort of real pain or fake pain or physical pain and psychological pain. And what I'm here to tell you, uh, because even you know, people treating pain can think of it this way sometimes, um, all pain is psychological. There's no place for your pain to be that isn't in your brain. Now we do have different ways of, of thinking about pain, two, mainly two different kinds of pain. We have acute and chronic or what is now being more often being called persistent pain. And they differ in a few different ways. One is duration. Acute pain happens less than three months. Generally, the pain signal is very useful and the expectation of relief is, is high. So if I put my hand on a hot stove, um, it's very useful to have a pain signal. In fact, it's so useful that by reflex, I'll probably retract my hand before I can even feel the pain um, and I'll, I'll learn not to do it again. Um, with persistent pain, it's pain that lasts longer than three months. And in terms of the signal, it's not very useful. After three months, you know you're in pain. You don't need to feel pain, but you still do. And the expectation of relief is low. If your pain hasn't gone away for three months, it's probably not going to, at least not completely. So in terms of sickle cell, we have various different kinds of pain. This is what makes treating sickle cell pain more complicated because patients with sickle cell have a combination of both acute and persistent pain. 
So in terms of acute pain, obviously there's vasoocclusive crises and, uh, and bone infarcts, swelling maybe from infections or other medical procedures. And then persistent pain, I mean, once you have you know, bone or joint damage, that tends to be long-term. People can get leg ulcers that can last for, for years. And obviously when people start using um, uh, opioid painkillers, that actually causes neuropathic changes in the way um, the body perceives pain and interprets those signals that causes ongoing pain. So the usual way we treat pain in sickle cell, so pain shows up, most of the time we give them opioid painkillers, and so we have a stimulus and a response, okay? So um, there's pain, they take the opioids, they get relief, that reinforces the behavior. This is learning, this is just basic operating condition, uh, conditioning. And that's usually drawn out in a line, but it's actually more of a cycle because there's more going on here. When you take opioids and you get relief, immediately you start developing tolerance. And so once you develop tolerance, that is when the opioids stop working as well as they used to, you start getting more pain. So when you get more pain, people get more opioids. And this leads to, I'm not sure if that's, I can move that, there we go. Um, people develop dependence. And over time, as this cycle continues, people get more and more tolerant and more and more dependent. But over time, their level of relief diminishes. So this is a problem. I'm just going to quickly review kind of the opioid crisis people have heard about in the United States. So this is a little bit dated, this particular one, but basically 30% of Americans, you know, over 300 million people, so 116 million is about a third, um, are living with chronic pain. That's a massive number. Um, and in the U.S., they have 4.6% of the world's population, but they consume 80% of the world's prescription opioids. The opioid epidemic in the US um, is pretty astonishing. Basically, in a single year, over 70,000 people died. That's a bit down from, I think, 2014, which is the last time I looked at this. Um, but um, what you see is a lot of people are misusing prescription opioids. Um, of note, Interestingly, only 14,000 deaths from overdosing on street heroin, but almost 50,000 deaths from overdosing on synthetic opioids. It's mostly uh, fentanyl. What you can see in terms of the pattern is way back in 1999, we started seeing an increase in um, deaths due to commonly prescribed opioids. And then at some point in about 2010, I think, we started noticing that there was this opioid epidemic and maybe prescribers started cutting back. People start turning to prescription heroin, or not prescription heroin, uh, street heroin. And we see a rise in those deaths. And then as the demand for heroin increases, um, that's been laced with other synthetic opioids, mostly fentanyl. And so we're seeing uh, an astonishing number of, of those deaths more recently. So um, the pattern with prescription opioid dependence at least in the U.S., mostly started with prescription OxyContin. When access gets cut back, people turn to heroin. Heroin gets cut with fentanyl, and that leads to a massive number of overdoses. The problem is not nearly as huge in the U.K. as it is in the U.S., but fentanyl deaths are up almost 30% in the U.K. Um, UK. U.K. opioid prescription has doubled in the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020. And I've, I've noted prescription opioids are common for treating chronic pain, even though the official guidance would say don't do that. Um, and those who are prescribed opioids, uh, a quarter of them are prescribed higher than the guidelines warrant. So um, the data for the UK, if we look at prescription opioid related deaths, again, the maximum here is about 300 in a year. Um, that's nowhere near what we're seeing in the US but uh, the trend is upward. And what you can see is most of the deaths, um, a lot of these are kind of weak opioids. And it's not really that these, these drugs are necessarily the, the cause of death, but they're just mentioned on the death certificate. So, um, but you can see the largest number is in other opioids, which are gonna be the stronger opioids. Anyway, back to um, treating sickle cell patients with opioids. 
Um, and really, it's not the case that we've had a huge, you know, some number of, of opioid related deaths with sickle cell. But in terms of actually treating people's pain, uh, treating pe people's pain with chronic opioid therapy is generally not a good idea. So a study from 2016 looked at, um, it was a matched uh, sample. So basically patients on chronic opioid therapy or not matched for severity of disease. And what they found is that as people were on uh, higher doses of opioids, they actually had more pain. And looking at central sensitization or hyperalgesia, um, the difference between people who were on chronic opioid therapy versus no chronic opioid therapy um, was stark. Um, basically, people on chronic opioid therapy have more pain um, than people um, not, despite the fact that their, their illness is just as severe. So my point here is, is if we're seeing people using maybe more painkillers than they should, we need to have a framework to identify what's going on. Um, so the situation for our patients, if this is just working, okay? So pain shows up and how do they respond? Well, at our hospital, um, patients can either treat their pain at home or they can come to the pain day unit, at least before COVID they could, um, for short-term relief with maybe a few injections and then go home. And if that doesn't work, then they can seek an inpatient admission. In all of these cases, they're taking opioids. At home, they're taking tablets. And, and at hospital, they're getting injectable opioids. So what should this look like? Well, ideally, oh, okay. We wanna see um, people managing, the bulk of the time, people managing themselves at home, some smaller subset of that seeking relief from the, the day service and an even smaller subset seeking an inpatient admission. So that's if everything is working the way it should. And how do we decide if there's a problem? So if someone's treating their pain at home and they're using more than 60 milligrams, oh, sorry, 60 milligrams of opioids per day, they're probably using too much. In order for chronic opioid therapy to be the most effective, we need to keep doses relatively low and, and using it sparingly. If they're attending for short-term uh, relief, less than, or if they're attending more than three times a month, that's a sign that there's a problem. And of course, the, the frequency and duration of their inpatient admissions, that is their total number of days spent in hospital per year, is a measure of, of how well they're doing. This is data collected by one of our consultants looking at um, the patients uh, in the pain day unit. Um, and what you can see here, each line represents a patient and the number is the number of times per year that they attended the pain day unit. Um, and what you can see, um, the red is just over half of the visits in a year, the blue is the other half. So what you can see is just over half of all cases in a year were accounted for by nine patients. And while the majority of patients, um, most of the time attended very rarely, when someone's got a problem, they're attending all the time. So if people are, are doing any one of these things, it's a sign that they're, they're coping inappropriately. A strategy is maladaptive when it seems to help initially, but it leads to greater harm later. And this applies um, in spades when it comes to opioid painkillers. So I'm trying to think about a framework and a number of profiles we can think about and what you can see. So the first profile, if they're low on everything, we're not really concerned about that. This is someone who's not really using, not in much pain, not using much painkiller. So often um, people's problems with painkillers starts um, with a lengthy inpatient stay. Maybe they've been getting injectable opioids for a long, long time. Um, but they're not normally using painkillers at home or otherwise. So this is a patient, this is their uh, level of admissions in 2013. And now we see 2014. So we see in August, 2014, all of a sudden they had this lengthy admission. So they would have been receiving injectable opioids for a long, long time. So after a lengthy inpatient admission, they tend to um, start taking painkillers at home. 
Maybe they don't want to be in hospital. No one likes to be in hospital. So they try to avoid coming by taking maybe more painkillers at home than they should. It's very easy not to notice this. I think this is the pattern we're seeing um, with COVID because everyone's trying to avoid coming to hospital. There's going to be a lot of people who are taking a lot more opioids at home to try to avoid coming to hospital because they don't want to catch COVID. But of course, as you're taking more tablets at home, um, maybe you start um, you know, coming to the pain day unit or, or uh, an outpatient uh, visit just for a few injections, okay? So what we see with this patient is after their lengthy inpatient stay, it's the red line, this is the next year. All of a sudden, they're starting to come to the, uh, for an outpatient ambulatory care um, quite a bit more than they used to. So as they're doing this, this is over you know, a period of years, they're building tolerance. So again, it's all of this is under the radar, but there's a problem brewing. So as pain is getting worse and they're starting to notice a problem, they're, they're using tablets at home, they're coming to the hospital a lot, even if they're not getting admitted. So what do they do? Well, maybe they try cutting back on their home opioids. And when they do that, their pain flares and they can't cope. Maybe they have an inpatient admission. Maybe they, you know, they're told they need to cut back on their outpatient visits. Again, they're having more pain flares, um, maybe more uh, inpatient stays. And of course, if you're high on all threes, this is the worst of all worlds. So this is this patient in 2015. 2016, you can see they're starting to come in more as an inpatient and you know, maybe a little less outpatient visits. This is 2017. So things are just totally spiraling out of control. And you can see in August, uh, they did seem to have some sort of resolution, but it quickly resumed and they're just coming into hospital all the time. So this is the problem. So we need to assess, you know, how much opioids are people using at home? How often are they coming for pain relief? How often are they getting admitted? Uh, how long are they being admitted? To try to figure out where are, where are people in this list of profiles? And the idea would be to intervene as early as possible, um, get a sense of how far along this path they are, and then refer them to a specialized pain service or specialized providers. So in most cases at this point, people have developed chronic or persistent pain and they need a comprehensive approach to manage pain. So I'm just gonna talk about the comprehensive pain management program that we're running at Hammersmith Hospital. And I, I'm saying it's starting soon all the time. I really do hope it's starting soon. Um, there's, there's been some delay. We ran one session of, of this a couple of years ago, but then our physiotherapist left and then COVID hit. So it's been delayed but we're starting it again and it's being, um, it's being revamped to be all virtual. So it's gonna actually be much easier for people to attend uh, and we can do it even if we're not allowed to meet in groups, but it's run by myself and a physiotherapist for both outpatient and patient support. We will have impulse, uh, input from consultants uh, with expertise in complex pain management and uh, helping us reduce reliance on pain medication. The core of the program is the pain management group. This is about eight sessions. Um, in addition, we're, we'll be offering these one-off uh, sessions to patients and their family just to, to get people to understand there's more to learn about pain maybe than they thought of before. Uh, there's opportunity for one-to-one -one psychology or physiotherapy input. Um, in addition to the, the group where we all meet together and discuss pain management, there's a separate exercise group led by the physiotherapist. Um, and again, this will all be virtual. Um, the idea is to try to get people uh, more mobile and reduce pain related from inactivity. Um, and on an as needed basis, we can refer to a specialist pain clinic. And of course, when we have a social worker in post, um, we can, as needed, we can refer to social work because oftentimes people's uh, people with sickle cell, their pain might be due to things like inadequate housing or they can't pay their heating bill. Um, and so a social, a social worker is, is there to help with those kinds of things. So in the group, um, one of the things we're going to be talking about is exploring their broader life goals. Oftentimes when people have chronic or persistent pain, they kind of drop everything else. 
um, uh, waiting for their pain to get better. And so we're, we're trying to help them explore what kind of a life do you really want to live with or without pain? Uh, we look at activity cycles um, and how that impacts pain, trying to get people to pace themselves and exercise in a way um, that allows them to gradually increase their level of activity rather than overdoing it and gradually decreasing their activity. Um, obviously, a focus on reducing reliance on opioids is going to be key to the group. Um, in general, the principle of reducing reliance on opioids will be teaching people to shift from short acting to long acting formulations. We want the reductions to be very gradual, no cold turkey. And we'd be looking at, at helping people um, avoid withdrawal, either by going very gradually uh, or seeing what other kinds of, of medications can be used to help with that. Obviously, there's a psychologist involved, so we're going to be looking at thoughts and emotions because those things can influence people's pain. As I mentioned before, pain is all about threat. And if you're telling yourself a bunch of negative thoughts, then your brain is going to perceive the situation as more threatening. It jacks up your pain. Uh, we'll be discussing relationships with family because these are sorts of stressors and all of that increases pain. Uh, giving people a plan for how to deal with pain flare-ups um, in a healthy way. Obviously, learning about the pain, mechanism, pain mechanisms we've been talking about and just general stress management. Uh, and if I can help anyone improve their sleep, uh, just that alone, I will consider it a, a job well done. Generally, we want to improve patients' quality of life overall, um, but it means that we have to do something different. If we do the same old thing, nothing's going to change. And so I think what I'm, what I'm appealing to you here for is, is there's going to be a two-pronged effort of both on, on the medical provider side of not maybe doing some of the things that are harmful, Hopefully, this will give people uh, more and helpful options. Anyway, that's it for my presentation. I think I blasted through because we're running behind. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much, Jeremy. Well done. Um, do we have any questions at all? I can't see. Oh, yes. If you put, yeah, yeah no, that's fine. If you put yourself off mute. Yes, that's it. Okay, thank you um, very much. If you miss a dose of opioid or one day's dose, how long does it take for withdrawal to kick in, please? Um, it, it can depend on the particular opioid that, that a person is taking, but I, I think the general principle is that, you know, people hit withdrawal after about two days. Um, so, I mean, if you miss a dose for a full day, the person will be very anxious and they won't be getting um, the, you know, if, if they have a source of pain, they won't be getting relief of the pain. So they will be feeling more pain, but the actual withdrawal probably won't hit for at least two days. That's, that's withdrawal symptoms like, like um, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, somnolence, um, those sort of classic withdrawal symptoms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lola? Yeah, Jeremy, just um, to find out, can GPs um, refer to you or do they have to go through the hospital consultant? Can, you know, if a GP is concerned um, yeah, that, you I, know, one of their patients is, you know, maybe having too much opiates, can they do a referral to you? And if yeah. so, how do they do that? Yeah, I, either or. Um, obviously, we want to coordinate as much as possible. But, um, you know, if, if the GP doesn't know, you know, which consultant to contact, um, they can certainly just refer directly to me and I, I'll coordinate with the consultant. Um, um, I'm, I'm happy to accept a referral from anyone um, and we'll sort out the billing later. That ties in with the question in the chat, Jeremy, that says, can a patient access your services directly? Is it by referral? How? Um, yeah, I mean, patients can self-refer. Obviously, if... if um, if patients are already a patient at Hammersmith Hospital, they can absolutely self-refer, and I probably know them already, so that's fine. Um, if they're patients from um, from other hospitals within the network, um, I think they can refer too. But it would probably be helpful if um, if the GP referred. Um, I haven't really sorted out the referral pathway, but honestly, 
it doesn't really cost us anything to, to put people in the group um, because my salary is paid, Zara's salary is paid, and it's virtual. So really, people can do the group and, and do the activities from anywhere in the world um, as long as they have an internet connection. I, I would say in terms of referral, we are looking for people essentially in a kind of a Goldilocks zone. We want people to be poorly enough that they, they can benefit from the service. If they're already managing their pain pretty well, we won't see much change. But we also don't want them to be so poorly that they can't attend and, and can't uh, you know, show up for meetings because they won't get any benefit either. Um, so what we want is people who are, are um, you know, doing well enough to attend, um, but have lots of room for improvement. And I, I think there are plenty of those people around. Lovely, thank you. Um, and if regarding the group, if you want sort of like to circulate any GP comms, you can contact me, Jeremy, and I'd be happy to do that. OK, that sounds great. All right, thank you very much. OK, so we're going to move on to our last presentation of the afternoon, and that's Dr. Lola Oni. And Dr. Lola, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, your um, your list of achievements is so long, but um, I'll ask you to um, to introduce yourself and your topic for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my list of achievements is is basically I'm a specialist nurse consultant here uh, at London Northwest NHS Hospital Trust, um, and I just wanted to um, just tell you that really I don't think there's anything else much about me that you know that's um, really going to be very helpful. Um, so my talk today um, is about the specialist um, sickle cell. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, brilliant. Um, it's about the specialist uh, community care and support um, that we're able to offer you um, within within the the sector. Um, so today I'm going to try and look at you know helping you to understand what services we provide uh, for you to understand the health and social challenges. Of living with sickle and foul, which I think Jeremy and others have already alluded to, um, and then looking at our role within the community, especially community specialist nursing, and then the referral pathways um, and the sort of resources that are available um, for supporting the patients and the clients within the community. So we all know that you know sickle cell disease is a chronic, unpredictable, lifelong disease with often early onset of signs and symptoms. Pain is the hallmark of sickle cell disease. Um, education is very you know, often disrupted. Psychological impact, which some of it Jeremy has, um, has spoken about. But apart from the psychological impact, there's also things like the stigma, labeling, the cultural, social issues uh, that go with living with these conditions. Sorry, this, um, I didn't want it to move yet. Um, and then, you know, you've got our family dynamics and the way in which family dynamics can, can play a part in the way in which you're able to manage your, your condition. Um, and they always having to be in contact with, with the hospital in some shape or form or with healthcare providers. Um, and that can really disrupt your, your life. For some of our patients, of course, it's things like regular having to have regular blood transfusions. For our thalassemia patients and those with sickle that are on transfusion, the chelation. Um, oh, why does this thing keep moving when I don't want it to yet? Sorry. Uh, risk of complications. Uh, I always say majority of patients with sickle cell disease do know people who have died as a result of sickle cell disease. There's always the fear of death at the back of their mind. Um, the um, and as I said, the psychological impact and so forth. Um, but why are we here? Why do we worry about all these things? Why do we think about the, the impact of, of, of sickle cell disease? Uh, I'm sure many of you would have seen this, this um, story, this, which was, oh, this, this, sorry, my slide keeps moving itself. Many of you would have seen this story of a, a young man uh, that died recently um, in 2018, 21 year old, um, had to ring uh, 999 from his hospital bed in a corridor um, because he was so desperate to get treatment and help um, and the nurses and doctors were not listening to him. They didn't understand that, you know, his sickle cell disease was, you know, was becoming more and more complicated. Um, and so he died 
um, as a result of lack of, basically the coroner uh, said that the, the individual died really as a result of lack of knowledge and skill uh, by those looking after him. So evidently, if we don't have knowledge and skill within every sector, between primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care, then our patients are, are, are going to have a lot more problems. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier on about the National, National Confidential Inquiry. When we did that inquiry in 2018, uh, we also looked at some of the deaths that occurred in primary care. Um, and we were able to demonstrate that within primary care, um, lack of knowledge also um, amongst primary care staff could result in patients actually dying in the community. And a number of patients did die in the community as a result of lack of knowledge and skill. Um, I think uh, Dr. Asad has already mentioned about the clinical standards. These are also available. These are the adult standards that came out in 2018. It's available on the Sickle Cell Society website. Um, so you can access that. Um, you can download it from the website. Similarly, the pediatric, um, the pediatric one, which is this is an old picture, then the new one uh, was released, uh, the third edition in 2019. Um, that's also available on the Sickle Cell Society website. Um, and the thalassemia uh, standards for care management of children and adults, uh, which came out in 2018, is also available, but that's on the UK thalassemia website. So when we're looking at um, specialist community services uh, within the West London, um, Dr. Assad already spoke about um, the development of the NHS England um, hemoglobinopathy strategy. Um, and we are the West London Hemoglobin of the Coordinating Centre, um, and we, we we go down to you know very far regions um, within the the west of London. So in most community centres, specialist centres, at the moment we've got um, we've got two three specialist community centres within the West London region, um, and these are uh, the Brent Sickle Cell Thalassemia Centre. You've got the the the, the, the CLCH. Uh, Community Specialist uh, Centre and Ealing and Hounslow. Those are the four within the and Wandsworth. Those are the five within the, the, the West London area. And who works in these uh, centres? Um, a significant proportion, the ones in the specialist areas, have a community specialist nurses and or health visitors. You've got clinical nurse specialists um, that are part of the, the same team, even though they work in the hospital. Um, you've got specialist midwives specialist clinical psychologists, social workers and welfare officers. Some areas have, some don't. Um, you've got a data manager and administrative staff. So these make up a majority of community centres. And the community centres, as I said, that's within the, the region that we cover, are Brent, Ealing, Wandsworth, Hounslow and Luton. Some of these centres are one, one man band um, centres, so to speak. They haven't got a physical centre. They're specialist community nursing support. So um, Ealing, um, Hounslow and Luton uh, are not a specific centre. They are um, community support services by a, specialist, uh, by a specialist nurse. So they wouldn't have all the other um, services associated with the specialist centre. So what's the role of our uh, specialist community nurse? Um, we offer screening, um, of, we screen all the screen positive women within our various um, hospital trust, trust hospitals. Um, in, we are what's considered a high prevalence area. So all women um, are screened for hemoglobinopathies, particularly for thalassemia um, and, and sickle cell disease if they choose to be tested. Um, so screening is um, high prevalence area screening. We manage newborn babies um, that are identified with the carrier state um, and those with disease state. Um, so we manage the newborn screening program, so we get no notified um, of all the newborn results, positive newborn re results, through um, a, a web-based system. And through that web-based system, newborn web-based system, we are notified of results directly from the lab, um, and we notify the parents of the carrier state, um, and those with disease states, we visit uh, to give the parents the result and to initiate the, the system for um, referring that baby um, to, for specialist care. We we'll routinely re refer babies for specialist care to their, their local um, hospital. So whether it be a local hemoglobinopathy team or a specialist hemoglobinopathy team. 
And then we offer support to children and adults. Um, and that means, you know, within our own specific uh, boroughs or trusts, uh, we, will, we do community visiting where we do um, assessments, number of visits, strategically uh, determined number of visits per year, that is to each patient. So we visit the children and we visit the adult within the community um, to do assessments as well as to provide them with support and care. Uh, and we do public awareness events. Um, for example, on Saturday is the global, the national um, sickle cell day. Um, and so you'll find a lot of specialist centers are uh, doing events um, around the national event, uh, around that national global sickle cell day. We participate obviously in education of health allied and other professionals. Um, and we participate in research, um, policy development, um, audits and so forth. I wanted to touch a little bit on, on the antenatal um, and the preconception area because I think certainly in terms of primary care, this is an area that we have been trying very hard to address for a long time. And this, I think, is an area that GPs and, and primary care staff can play a significant role. Um, the Human Genetics Commission, which no longer functions, but in the day when they did um, a report, uh, they were looking at increasing options, informing choices, looking at preconception uh, genetic testing and screening. Um, and one of the things they said is that preconception genetic testing, which includes testing for carrier status for a range of genetic conditions, um, it can be beneficial um, if, it's get, if it's done early enough um, for us to identify the population um, and then offer individuals and their families uh, genetic testing. Um, and so therefore, it would be really quite useful. Um, a number of GPs within our area um, have, have done this in the past. Uh, we did some work with some GPs in the past as well, whereby they're able to offer the, 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 the childbearing population within their area the opportunity to be tested. Um, even if it's not done within the surgery, um, GPs can, can take a, a, a role in, in directing people to their local uh, specialist um, community centre where they can get uh, testing and, and ongoing counselling as required if they're found to have a haemoglobinopathy. So the whole idea of carrier status information that's also um, received um, incidentally through tests or investigations, for example, people who are going uh, for surgery that are routinely tested when the GP is sent the outcome of after their surgery, the GP will be aware that that person has been identified with a haemoglobinopathy. So what the GP does with that information is also quite important. Apart from storage of the information, is the individual aware that they've been identified with a haemoglobinopathy? Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, the newborns, um, you know, the newborn screening, and no GPs are always notified of those with um, disease and carrier states, um, and then trying to work out what do GPs do with that information. Do they store it in a way that that can be shared with an individual as they're getting older and getting towards the, the, the age where they're going to start having children and, and uh, getting married and so forth? So GP should have an efficient bring forward system to ensure that young people are made aware that carrier status information may be available in their health records and could be communicated to them as they mature and become adults. Um, and that will go a long way in helping people when they're making uh, genetic informed choices, when they're making choices about relationships, um, you know, getting married or, or starting a family, uh, rather than waiting until when they're pregnant um, and they then go and book at the local hospital and then they're told that they're a carrier. The moral obligation to share personal genetic information that may be relevant in order to avoid harm may fall both on the people tested and on clinician. Um, and or others who are aware of a relevant test result. Um, and so I always um, emphasize um, the importance of the GP's role in terms of testing or offering of testing and counseling uh, to the population. So who do we need to think about offering testing to? Well, I've already alluded to that in that, you know, the childbearing population who are registered at the GP surgery. Um, evidently, we do test uh, pre-medical treatment, for example, pre-anesthetic, um, pre-surgery or dental care. 
um, routine health screening of women uh, and men, particularly in family planning and so forth, and preconception. Uh, for example, women or couples who go for IVF service or treatment, uh, they get offered the option or the opportunity uh, to be tested. And then you've got your opportunistic uh, through awareness campaigns and, and so forth. And people who've told you about a family history, uh, because, you know, GPs and primary health care staff are those that people tend to speak to first before they even get to anyone else. Um, so taking advantage of that and, and you know, um, offering people the opportunity uh, when they mention to you that they've got a, a brother or sister or cousin or somebody who's got sickle cell, um, taking the opportunity to educate them and if, re if re required, um, referring them on. It doesn't always have to be done by the GP practice. So just really just um, getting them to the right place. So what other parts of the role um, is there for the primary care team? So I've already mentioned about the, the reg on your register, identifying those at risk, offer of testing. Um, if positive, either offering counselling um, or referring them um, for counselling and then registering those who've been tested, particularly of, uh, either negative or positive. Um, and always ensuring that the patient has the information themselves. So, for example, when they're tested at our centre, we always give them a copy um, of their of their lab report or we give them a haemoglobinopathy card. Um, and these are the haemoglobinopathy cards, for those of you who are interested, are available from the Brent Sickle Cell Thalassemia Centre. Um, and where relevant, offering, you know, testing uh, to partners, uh, if it's a childbearing um, person, um, who's considering maybe starting a family um, and then thinking they may want to think about the options that are available to them if they're at risk. For example, being able to access pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and so forth. Um, and then the antenatal women, as I said earlier on, um, ideally um, you don't need to wait until a woman is booked at the antenatal clinic um, before she can be tested for haemoglobinopathy. So as soon as um, a, a woman comes to you, she, she thinks she's pregnant, uh, she's maybe eight weeks pregnant, you can still refer her for counselling. She doesn't have to wait until she goes to the antenatal clinic. So you can refer her to the specialist nurse uh, or the specialist midwife um, in your area uh, for her to start the process of accessing the genetic information that she needs. You can also offer partner testing or you can refer the partner to come and get tested at the centre with or without the woman. Uh, she doesn't, you know, he doesn't have to be uh, tested alongside uh, the woman or come with the woman. And then if an at-risk couple is identified, if they've been tested by the primary care team, um, if the at-risk couple have been identified, then referring them to the, like I said, to the sickle cell centre for genetic counselling, um, pre, even pre-booking at the hospital. And that's to enable them to be able to access genetic information to make choices about the pregnancy as early as possible so that if they want to access um, prenatal diagnosis, they can do so as early as possible. If that, if you haven't got a, a specialist um, center in your area, uh, because I'm aware that there are um, others that may be on the call that may not have a specialist center in their area, they can still refer um, the woman for counselling at any centre, at the Brent Centre or any of the other specialist centres uh, and they can be seen. Then we've got the newborn carriers, uh, as I said earlier on, ensuring that we register the result um, and have a system in place whereby the information can be conveyed uh, to the patient as they get to the age uh, where they're able to um, digest that information uh, and make use of it. And then, of course, we've got the adults and children uh, with disease states. Um, we, we, I think Doc, Dr. Assad has already mentioned um, about the, the prophylactic treatments um, in terms of medication. Can I please plea with GPs? Uh, I get, you know, very frustrated parents who are prescribed their penicillin one, two week doses, um, you know, and it really becomes very, very difficult. And we always plead with GPs to try and see if they can prescribe two or three month supply of prophylactic penicillin uh, because they're going to be on this medication for five years at least minimum. Um, at the moment in, in the UK, we do encourage our patients to continue on their prophylactic penicillin at least all the time while they're in, um, in full time in education. 
because of the obviously the risk of the pneumococcal infection is higher in, in that group that goes to school or college or university. So I usually encourage my patients and we encourage our patients to continue the penicillin and a lot of the adults also continue the penicillin even in adulthood. Um, and then, of course, monitoring that, you know, that they're taking their prophylactic medications. If somebody hasn't been for a prescription, you give them two months prescription and they haven't been for six months. That obviously would, would suggest that they're not adhering to the prescribed treatment. Um, and so they, therefore, uh, that gives room for educating the patients as to why they need to be on this medication uh, and why they need to take it consistently. Um, and making sure that they're accessing their specialist vaccinations. Um, apart from their routine vaccinations, uh, all the other vaccinations that have been mentioned by Dr. Assad um, also. Um, and keeping and maintaining routine health checks um, and en encourage them to attend their outpatient appointments uh, because a lot of patients feel uh, sometimes reluctant to come to outpatients because they come to outpatients two, three years in a row and all they hear is everything is fine, you know, your blood tests are, are all okay. And they haven't been in hospital, therefore they don't see any point in coming to hospital. But try to emphasize to them, and I think this is a major role for particularly for primary care, because you're the ones that will then see the patients that are very well um, and don't come in and out of hospital. Um, so try to emphasize to them the reason why they should still maintain um, and go for their outpatient appointments um, is because we want to be able to pick up something before it becomes you know, more serious or cannot be rectified. Um, so we always encourage our patients to make sure uh, that they, they do attend their outpatient appointments, even though it can be very boring, whereby, you know, the doctor only says, yes, you're fine and they'll see you for 20 minutes and you're out of there and you spent two hours sitting in the waiting room. Um, but we need to we need GPs to help us uh, to emphasize that to uh, the patients. We do, as I said, we do take referrals either by uh, either by paper form. Uh, we do have secure NHS net um, email generic addresses as well, which I'll share with you in a moment. Um, and, you know, anyone can be referred, either referred for testing or referred for, for counselling after they've been tested or referred for, for care um, and support in the community because we have specialist nurses uh, that do look after the patients in the community. So if you're worried about a patient or you have a concern, uh, I think the first port of call is to, you know, is to refer them to the specialist um, community nurse if, you know, if it's an issue um, that's related to, you know, obviously not related to their acute care or, or their clinical uh, management issues. But families, for example, with, you know, issues like housing problems, um, non-adherence to, to treatment, uh, patients that are having, you know, problems that they're not able to cope with or need advice on or support with. Uh, parents and children. Um, so anything like that is always useful to do a referral um, and, and always include obviously all the relevant information, but all, also ensure that the patient is aware that the referral has been made so that when we contact them, um, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, more often than not, we will know the patient, um, but of course, a lot of patients move around um, and so when they move into the area and they come and register with the GP, we may not be aware that, they, that, that they're in our borough. Uh, so if you get a new patient with sickle cell disease, um, it's always useful to, to refer them to the community specialist nurse so that we're aware that, you know, we need to follow them up in the community uh, and support them in the community and assess them. Um, I'm not going, I've taken some of the slides in relation to this out because Dr. Assad has already covered it. Um, about the development, the new developments in NHS England um, and, you know, the way in which strategically services are now uh, provided um, in England. Um, so I won't go into that now. So these are some of the useful um, links um, that you may want to access. Um, and thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Oni. Um, oh, I've got a bit of um, feedback. OK, oh, thank you so Sorry, much. You have, um, to, you have to um, stop me at sharing because for some reason my system's not letting me. Unshare. That's fine. That's fine. I can I can do that. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, um, I don't know if there's any questions, but um, if you do have any questions after, you can email me or the GP liaison inbox and we can pass it on to the team. But um, for today, if there are no questions, I'd just really like to say thank you, 
always worthwhile. Um, Dr. Dr. Oni mentioned um, the young gentleman that died um, uh, in 2018, and that really struck me about how much, you know, how much more we need to learn. Um, and so, yeah. Oh, Assad. Yes, um, I just wanted to add something as well, if that's OK, um, because because um, I didn't have really time to talk about it in too much detail during the presentation. But in terms of prescribing around opioids, um, kind of alluding to what Jeremy was saying earlier, during the pandemic, um, we worked with Jeremy's help to um, contact a lot of the GP colleagues um, requesting that they prescribe the opioids uh, for, for patients who, who were on long term opioids. And at the same time, there's a group of patients uh, who Jeremy has worked very closely with um, to to uh, produce a weaning program to reduce this opioids gradually over a number of weeks and months. Um, and I think looking forward, um, I just wanted to get some feedback from any GPs regarding um, how, how that's going with prescribing the opioids for, for patients. And I think we would very much look to um, a, a kind of interactive process of communication between us and, and the GP uh, colleagues uh, regarding prescribing patients opioids in the long term. I'm happy to facilitate that, Assad. I don't know how you would want to do that. Just wondering if any if anyone on the court just now wants to provide any any kind of feedback on whether they've had any experience of that and how, how it's working. Any feedback at all? No, I think, I, oh, no, our GP colleagues are probably yep. feeling a bit shy today. Um, no, there's no questions, but I would like to reiterate that if you do have any questions um, outside of the meeting, I'm quite happy to pass it along to the team. Um, but it's been a it's brilliant afternoon of education. Um, and I wanted to say, I'm going to be sharing your slides um, where GPs can access them on our GP and referrers section. Um, so if there's, I will, I'll come back to you guys later if there's anything that you want us to remove or, or anything like that. But but um, I will I will contact you. But just to say thank you so much. It's been an excellent afternoon. Um, and actually saying that for me, I'm thalassemia trait. Um, and I only found out when um, I became pregnant as an adult. Um, fortunately, my other half wasn't thalassemia trait because that's where there may have been a problem. And so for me, is there anything to look out for? I mean, aside from, I mean, outside of, you know, procreating, which is, not for me anymore with somebody else, but anything I need to look out for. I've always suffered from anemia. Is there any correlation? That kind of stuff. Any of you? Lola, we'll let you okay. answer that. Okay. Yeah. Um, certainly in terms of beta far carrier, no, there's not really not. You, you'll always have a low grade anemia. Uh, that's only because your red cells are a bit smaller and a bit paler. Um, we always say to people, you know, don't let GPs or whoever prescribe you, you know, um, iron medication because that's not what's causing your your slightly lower hemoglobin level. Um, so oh. unless unless they can prove that you're definitely iron deficient. Um, so but they need to do special tests for that to know whether you're iron deficient or not. Um, so if you're not iron deficient, then you don't need iron tablets. Um, so really, it's only important, it's only significant uh, when you want to have children. And of course, like you said, you you know, you've decided you, you don't want to have any more. But of course, it's important for your children if you've got children, when they come to have children, if they are also, if they've taken the gene from you, it's for them to be aware that they're a carrier. Um, and, and also the, the type of beta file that you tend to see in black people tends to be what we call beta plus thalassemia as, as, as opposed to beta zero. So the chances of, you know, you passing on a beta zero is a bit smaller. But are you from the Caribbean? No, Africa. Africa. So, the, the, you know, the chance of you being beta zero is, is very, very small. Um, I mean, those in the Caribbean, some a few of those um, have beta zero, but very, 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 very unusual. So it's only really in terms of having children more than anything. Oh, well, that's uh, that that boat sailed. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so 
Brilliant. Uh, the, the iron thing, I have been on iron tablets for the mo most of my adult life, actually. It's only really the last few years. So it just goes to show, but I'll definitely check that out. That's really useful yeah. to know. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, just to say thank you again, Dr. Oni, Assad, Stephen, Jeremy, excellent afternoon. We've recorded, we've recorded the meeting, so we will be uploading it and I'll let you guys know. For our GP attendees, um, there are um, certificates of attendances that you can claim your CPU points um, and they'll be sent out to you in the chat um, along with the program I've also um, shared the evaluation form which we would really appreciate you completing so that we can go back to the team if there are areas that we need to improve or anything that we need to change it would be good to get your feedback and so with five minutes left which as I think is a record ever I'd like to say thank you very much and hopefully I'll see you all again soon and take care most importantly thanks Jocelyn thank, thank you, you. Okay. Bye, 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 bye. Bye, bye 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 thank you everybody bye